Okay, mm -hmm. folks, I think we might make a start for the afternoon sessions. Uh, so for the afternoon session, um, we will start with um, providing a little bit of context um, around the tender. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about the government's um, new approach to encouraging uh, investment in minerals exploration into Victoria. Um, we uh, will then hear from uh, Craig Clifton from uh, the Jacobs Group, who's done an important piece of work for us uh, in relation to, to regional context. Um, we're privileged to have uh, our traditional owner um, representatives uh, here today to um, present uh, on, uh, on traditional owner matters. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to ask um, questions and answers or have a question and answer session um, with that, with that um, segment as well. Uh, we'll then have afternoon tea for about 20 minutes and then after the afternoon tea um, we'll have the tender briefing session and there'll be an opportunity uh, to ask questions in that session also. Um, so we'll wrap everything up by 3.30 and, um, and I hope you find this afternoon as informative um, as this morning. Um, so I'd just like to start with a, a little bit um, on the, the regional context uh, for, um, for the tender. Uh, so in August 2018, uh, the Victorian government released its um, state of discovery, thanks, uh, its state of discovery mineral resources strategy, uh, and that's Victoria's blueprint uh, for generating investment, jobs, and economic development for our regions through fostering uh, exploration uh, and uh, development of our mineral resources in a sustainable way. So uh, the mineral resources strategy outlines an integrated approach. Um, that the government is taking uh, to attracting investment and that approach includes um, geoscience research and uh, compiling pre-competitive geoscience information um, which we heard some fantastic examples of uh, this morning and uh, particularly focusing in on um, areas where we believe the greatest prospectivity exists. Um, understanding the local uh, land features and um, aspects and special places of importance to our traditional owners and to local communities. Uh, engaging and working with local communities and uh, traditional owners and other stakeholders um, within those areas, um, both uh, to um, in, in, in the sense of sort of working up uh, an opportunity and also um, with explorers working with those parties as part of their exploration programs throughout, um, and conducting competitive tenders uh, in some cases to attract um, capable and experienced explorers with good social values. Uh, and those tenders are particularly around uh, the most prospective opportunities here in Victoria. So um, many of you might, may be aware that this approach was initially trialled in the Staveley uh, Arc in Western Victoria uh, last year, as John Krableski alluded to this morning. And we've certainly uh, learnt, uh, learnt some lessons from uh, that process, which we've carried forward into uh, the Goldfields um, ground, uh, ground release approach. So um, understanding the local land context um, the features and the as aspects and special places um, offers several benefits. So um, it helps us as government to identify areas um, that may be suitable for exploration, but it also provides explorers the opportunity to have a greater understanding of the regional context um, in which their exploration programs um, may be conducted. So for these reasons, uh, the department undertook to uh, commission Jacobs uh, to compile an inventory of key features and special places of, of importance throughout the ground release area. Uh, and also to assess the potential impacts of exploration and mining, um, given the existing regulatory and legislative controls uh, that exist. Um, so Jacobs has produced a report um, with the outcomes of their work and also um, GIS data sets, both of which are available um, for potential tenderers. Um, they're available on the tenders website for download. Um, so I'll just mention that in the process of conducting the study, uh, there were several information sources used. There were public information sources used, which Craig will talk more about. Um, but we also undertook really strong consultation with a whole range of stakeholders, local stakeholders within the ground release area, uh, to ensure that um, those data sets would be as complete as possible. So Craig will talk a little bit more about that. Um, so before I hand over to Craig, I might just mention that uh, it's worth noting that uh, the study contains available information only, so um, it's extremely likely um, that there is more information out there on, uh, on other uh, features which may not have been picked up uh, in the study. 
um, and the assessments um, were conducted by Jacobs. Um, so I'll just mention that the mineral resources strategy that um, John alluded to this morning, this is what it looks like. It's available on the website for download. Uh, and as I mentioned, the accompanying data sets um, also are on the tender's website um, with the tender reference number of NCVG uh, 2019. Uh, you don't need to remember that because these slides will all be um, later provided on our website. So they'll be available for download. Uh, and I think as someone mentioned this morning, um, these sessions are all being video recorded as well to ensure that if you missed anything, you can go back and watch the video recordings. And also for folks who weren't able to make it today, they'll have access to the same information that all of us here have had access to. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Craig to the podium uh, to talk us through the land inventory assessment uh, and uh, its key findings. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Fiona. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon is the, the project, as Fiona was talking about, the North Central Victorian Goldfields Land Inventory and Assessment Project. The project is one that fits in with the, uh, the new strategic approach to ground re release and exploration, as Fiona was talking about. And in particular, it covers off on some aspects of the resource and land use planning and the engagement of, with uh, communities and, and traditional owners and stakeholders. The project itself did a number of things which are indicated on the, the left hand of the slide there. So we identified what we called regionally significant land uses, values, areas and other features, things that collectively we call features of interest. We also through that process identified features that would be of high interest to local communities. Those features were represented in spatial data sets and compiled in an inventory. Uh, that has the features, but also indicates infrastructure that may be used to support exploration and any subsequent mining activity. As part of the process, we did an assessment, as Fiona said, of the sensitivity, I guess in inverted commas, of those features to the potential impacts associated with exploration and any future mining, and then thought about how the uh, regulatory framework for uh, exploration and mining in the state actually helps to control those potential impacts. And I'll step through that project and the, the various outputs from that process um, in this presentation. First of all, talking about the inventory, it was the, the first main part of the project. The inventory itself was essentially a, a data mining exercise to find out information about those features of interest, compile that into a report, but particularly into a, a geospatial spatial database. We've drawn information from that from a range of data libraries, uh, records that are in the public domain, as well as creating data sets that, uh, that represent features of interest that are spelled out and, and documented in various plans and strategies and reports for which there may not actually be easily obtainable spatial data. As I said before, the information contains uh, data about the features of interest, but also about uh, infrastructure that could support exploration and mining. And we call these explicit sources. So these are the kinds of information that plan strategies, existing data sets say are features of regional significance. Also through the consultation process, particularly through the consultation that the department did and we did with local government, highlighted features that were perhaps more implicit where they're known to be of value or recognised by local communities. And there wasn't necessarily any formal existing uh, spatial data that would represent those things. So part of the process was to create data sets that we could compile in that inventory to allow people to know about those things. And the process was governed by a set of definitions that helped us and, and, a, and a process that helped us provide a process that was transparent, was consistent and could be repeated. And the process that we took for this was similar to the, the one that we adopted for the Staveley project. In terms of the process itself, the first thing to do was to establish those de definitions and develop an initial set of criteria by which we might uh, define those features of interest. The kinds of criteria are there on the, the right-hand side of the slide, so some explicit things like it's listed in an inventory of uh, natural or cultural significance, a matter that might be the subject of an international treaty, for example, migratory birds uh, listed with the uh, uh, Japan, Chinese, Korean migratory bird agreements, something that's defined in a plan or strategy, for example, key natural resource management areas are identified in the North Central Catchment Management Authority's uh, 
regional catchment strategy, things that are recognised to have particular environmental value, population centres and the like. So we worked through that, defined those criteria, ran some workshops with a range of regional authorities, which included various state government agencies, local governments, and we had a workshop with a couple of the traditional owner groups as well to talk through this process. The information, as I said, was compiled into an inventory, uh, which is available to you and then documented in a, in a report. And as I said, it contains those explicit and implicit features. So what does that mean? What kinds of things are we talking about when we say features of interest? The map sort of highlights some examples of those from the, the Goldfields region. Broadly speaking, there are five categories, things of environmental value, uh, heritage features, infrastructure features, water and, and various land uses. So environmental features could include uh, threatened native species, remnant vegetation, wetlands and the like. Um, we also included land care environmental plantings, which were, I guess, what we, you would call a, an implicit feature. Heritage features, natural and historic heritage. I would note that we include in, in the inventory uh, areas of Aboriginal cultural sensitivity. Uh, through consultation with traditional owners, we did not include private information about the location of particular sites and features of Aboriginal heritage significance. And part of the rationale for that was the incompleteness of that record. And so it was discussed and the, the decision was taken because of the incompleteness of that record, rather than suggest that these are the places where you're okay from a traditional, uh, from an Aboriginal cultural perspective, better that as explorers you're looking out because wherever you encounter Aboriginal heritage, that heritage is protected. And similarly with, with some of the threatened species, and it may be more a matter for, for the mining stage in this, this sort of process, you know, there are plenty of threatened species records throughout the region, but it, their records that, that sort of by happenstance exist. Where you search for others, you may well find them as well. So it's an important proviso in the data set. It records known information in publicly available records. Uh, the infrastructure we included to, to define things that would be potentially support exploration and mining, like some of the transportation uh, infrastructure, but also captures information on uh, energy, uh, energy provision, agricultural infrastructure, potential areas for solar farm development, which is uh, expanding rapidly in parts of north central Victoria. Water is an important asset within the region and so we've defined various features from that perspective. In the south is Lake Epilock and its catchment. Uh, below the, the lake there's the Campaspe River and the, uh, um, the aquifer that uh, is uh, fed by the river and, and rainfall as well, which is an important source of environmental flow but also irrigation in the area and in the north there's the infrastructure that provides irrigation water to the dairy and horticultural production areas in, in the uh, Campaspe area, the, the lower Campaspe area around south of uh, Echuca. And of course there are a variety of land uses, there are towns, uh, areas of uh, private and public land that are valued for various things including agriculture nature conservation, recreation, and the like. We identified 46 classes of feature, and of which there are many hundreds and probably thousands of individual features that have been identified in that, through that process. So I won't go into detail in all of those, but suffice to say there are a number of outputs coming out of the process that are available to you. One is a block summary, which is included in some of the tender documents, which block by block summarises some of the key features associated with each, each of those blocks, covering the various categories that I was talking about before. Uh, the raw geospatial data has been consolidated in, into a single database so that you don't have to do what my team did and bring bits and pieces of data from all sorts of places. This is a consolidated reference of the known information relating to the central Victorian goldfields. And we also prepared a gridded data set, which allows us for each 500 by 500 metre grid cell in that area to identify what are all, what are all of the features of interest within that particular grid cell. So it, it takes away the this sort of spatially explicit nature of that information, um, but tells you for this 500 by 500 metre grid area, you've got, you know, you've got some native threatened species, you've got some uh, uh, Aboriginal cultural sensitivity, you've got a river, you've got a part of Lake Epilock's catchment or whatever the case may be. And so the, the map on the right hand side, you know, the bluey, greeny colour end of the spectrum is showing where you've got concentrations 
of features of interest, which tends to follow the, the sort of drainage pathways there. So those two geospatial data sets are available to you uh, and as, as a product from this, this project. The second part of the project that we did was looking at, well, what may it mean if these features are there and exploration and mining activities took place? Uh, what is the sensitivity of those features? What may happen? And a way, our, our, way, our method for assessing um, what we might call broadly sensitivity was using sort of vulnerability as a framing tool. And it's something that is commonly used in climate change um, and uh, has these three key dimensions. It has sensitivity. So, you know, are the features sensitive to the hazards that may occur? Exposures, are they likely to experience those hazards or any effects from exploration and mining? And in, in a sort of a, a sort of ex vulnerability um, context, we usually use adaptive capacity, but here we're talking about regulatory control. So can the regulatory controls and planning process mi mitigate those potential effects? And so um, went through a process of thinking about these things. So the first aspect is exposure. And so that really is about what the inventory has compiled. What are the features that are out there? Um, and also, to what extent does the regulatory framework govern the exposure of those features to, uh, to activities associated with exploration and mining? And I'll go back into that in, in a moment. We, talk, we thought about, well, what kinds of hazards are potentially associated with exploration and mining? And broadly related them into those, those categories there. And as I said, considered those sort of two phases in the, in the life cycle. And then thought about what the uh, leg legislative and planning controls. How effective could they be, not just in governing exposure, but mitigating, helping to control the potential effects of those activities uh, on the, the various features of interest. First of all, thinking about exposure. So the regulatory framework, you know, particularly the uh, Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Act, influences the exposures of of exposure of features. Broadly speaking, there are two classes of land, land that's available for those activities, land that is not available. Land that's unavailable within this area is really is national park. Um, and so there are areas of national park within and adjacent to the Goldfields area. There's also a proposed national park in the, uh, in the um, Wellsford Forest area. It's currently state forest, uh, but is proposed under the, the VAC recommendations to become national park. If that recommendation is accepted, then that means not that exploration can't occur, but it can only occur below 100 metres depth. The other category of land, which is most of the land within this area, is potentially available, although the regulatory framework has, uh, has processes that, that sort of influences the, the level of protection of things in, in parts of that area. So there's restric restricted public land, which considers crown land that follows uh, some watercourses through the area, nature conservation reserves, mm -hmm. land in pro proximity to existing housing uh, uh, for exploration, but more particularly mining, land within 100 metres of recorded Aboriginal historic heritage features, and land within 100 metres of land that's vested in the water authorities. And so you can see in the north, there's a whole lot of land that's sort of slight, shaded quite, less, quite uh, a little bit more lightly than the rest of it. That's representing the uh, irrigation, drain, irrigation channels and, and drainage structures that are quite pervasive through that irrigation area. So there's an intensity of infrastructure in that space. And very important to point out as well that under other regulation or other legislation apart from the MRSDA, uh, Aboriginal and historic heritage features, whether they've been recorded or not, may not be disturbed without permit the appropriate permissions. Really important because that provides protection of those features from potential exposure to exploration or subsequent mining activity. And so you can see you know, different levels, the green highlighting the least exposed and that's an area of National Park, which is actually is, not, is adjacent to, but not within the ground release area. And then you've got uh, various others. And the majority of the area is, is agricultural land, which is uh, you know, fully available for exploration subject to the sort of normal planning constraints. Um, I guess when Lake Apollox fill, it might be difficult to do some aspects of exploration, particularly from a ground perspective, but there's at the moment plenty of freeboard in Lake Epilock as well. Um, 
Sensitivity to exploration. I guess that's, you know, what is the sensitivity of those features to hazards that may be associated with the activities? And we looked at these categories. So, you know, displacement or disruption of the existing land use. So would vegetation be disturbed? Would, and, and you know, not so much for exploration, but for mining, for example, would the ac existing agricultural uh, land use uh, be, be disturbed? Would it have an effect on the recreational amenity or the, the cultural value of the place? Is there opportunity for the contamination of land, water, or air? May it, will it, would it create noise that, that would disturb uh, those features? Would it create geotechnical hazards associated with the movement of rocks or soil? Um, would there be changes in the surface water or groundwater conditions? So would there be dewatering, for example, or other uh, influence on surface water flows because land's contained within a, in a structure that sort of diverts flows? And would, it, uh, would the activity uh, use or infrastructure, you know, for example, energy infrastructure, and so compete with other uses or water infrastructure? And so the exploration was carried out looking separately at uh, exploration carried out under the code of practice for low impact exploration, as well as uh, more intensive activities that might be covered by a work plan. And as you can see, uniformly across the area, not, not a particularly uh, discriminatory map, um, but uniformly across the area, very low sensitivity. And you can see on the graph below some difference in the, ki in the, uh, the sensitivity depending on the kinds of hazard uh, for exploration uh, as well. Mining would have a, a greater level of sensitivity. So we looked at the effectiveness of regulatory controls and the types of things that we consider in that process was the process to, to gain planning consent, either through a, an EIS or other kinds of pro kind of process the requirement to comply with the code or work plan, the provision of compensation, access payments or offsets for environmental effects, the requirement to rehabilitate land post disturbance, the fact that there is a water allocation framework and markets that govern the, the requirement, if there is a requirement to, to use and extract water for a mining activity, as well as heritage legislation applicable to Aboriginal and historic features. That all came together, added together into an overall assessment of potential impacts that considered exposure, sensitivity, and the regulatory control framework. And you can see some variability, is, again, much of it associated with the, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of places where exposure is affected. Low vulnerability in those places like national parks that are where mining cannot or exploration cannot occur. Uh, others where you've got protections because of the, the kind of space that they're, they're in. And, and very little difference between those two phases of the exploration, either conducted under a code or uh, a work plan, reflecting similar levels of exposure. Uh, the regulatory framework operates effectively in both cases. And generally speaking, uh, exploration activities are relatively small scale, short in duration. Uh, and so that, particularly relative to mining, and so that reduces the overall sensitivity. And the final slide uh, is the outputs of that process. So we have a final project report with which, as Fiona uh, said, is available to you. There are the data sets and then it's a block summary, which is part of the, the tender documentation. Uh, as, so, you know, the intent is that this would be a resource that, to the extent that you're interested, is available for you to, to use as part of your endeavours. Thank you.